Yeah, uh, super. So, yeah, as uh, Anna said, Claire couldn't be here. Um, so we decided out of kind of convenience, instead of trying to play around with having me talking into a pre-recorded something, that we just pre-recorded our conversation. And then I'll come up on stage again and um, answer any potential questions you might have. Uh, but so, yeah, please, let's play the video and I'll go through the bizarre experience of listening to my own like conversation. But, uh, and then, yeah, just uh, feel free to save any questions for later. Hello and welcome to our discussion on the political potential of OSPOs um, here at OSPOCon London. I am I'm really sorry not to be with you in person today. I think Aster will be with you in person today. So um, I'm going to get Aster to give a wave now on screen for the recorded piece, but also a wave in person somewhere around us, uh, because we're hoping that, uh, that he will be also there in person. But we are delighted to be here today to talk about this really important topic. My name is Claire Dillon. Um, I work with Intersource Commons. I also am involved in the OSPO++ network, which is a global network of OSPOs who have come together to collaborate in the public sector space from universities, from cities, from governments and from civic institutions. Um, I'm here with Aster. Aster, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aster Nemelin Karlberg, Policy Director with uh, Open Forum Europe. We're at the same time working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. Thank you, Aster. And we're here today to talk about this idea of the political potential of OSBOs. So Aster, perhaps if you can move to the next slide, what we might just reflect upon is the fact that we have seen a huge growth in the momentum of the creation of OSBOs outside the private sector and outside the idea of a corporate OSBO. And we're seeing them in universities, in cities and in countries. Um, they're springing up at a regional level or sometimes even in global organizations or NGOs. So we have some examples here, um, Aster, again if you if you can if you can thank you show those but we're seeing them across the world in universities like Johns Hopkins University the Rochester Institute of Technology UCA UCLA Santa Cruz in the US also places like Trinity College Dublin here in my hometown um, but all across the world we're seeing many more universities um, create OSPOs as a central point for their open source uh, activities. But also we're seeing a growth in cities and countries. Paris has recently announced that they're creating an OSPO and we're seeing them pop up all across Germany and in other countries as well. At a regional level, uh, the European Commission has recently created their OSPO as well. We're seeing them in the Cascadia region in the United States. But across the world, we're starting to see more and more OSPOs looking at these challenges at a regional level. And of course, in global organizations or NGOs like the United Nations, they are also exploring the idea of how they can use OSPO to uh, progress their goals. So Aster, maybe we'll have a little think about the recent uh, report that came out from the European Commission to give an indication about why this is such an important theme at this point in time. Sure. Thanks, Claire. Um, so uh, early September, the European Commission published its uh, I would say a landmark study on the impact of open source software and hardware on technological independence, competitiveness, and uh, innovation. Uh, we call it just the, the open source study for short. And it has to do with the economic impact and it was meant to be used as kind of the background document, that foundational study for, for uh, understanding where open source is in the market in Europe today. And uh, from our point of view, working with public policy and open source and open technologies in general, um, um, there's of course a lot to, to be said around this study, but one of the kind of overarching points is that it has perhaps not changed the arguments we're using, uh, promoting uh, open technologies, but it, it has added more to our toolbox. And uh, in short, there's this transition of, of moving away from um, an old style of argumentation towards a new style of argumentation and understanding of where open source is. So in many ways, the old way of thinking about it has been kind of like uh, uh, open technologies for the sake of open technologies. Um, it's the way we should approach things in, especially in the public sector uh, for its kind of, you know, moral benefits. There's this should argument. Um, and and then, of course, there's been a big focus in the public policy space around open source and procurement law. And one of the big takeaways from our, our study is that uh, 
writing a good law, it's not enough. Uh, the main success factor for any kind of open source initiative uh, coming from the government uh, has, you know, is the degree of kind of cultural shift in the organization. Uh, it's about education, buy-in within the, the hierarchy. Um, so in our view, the most important things and actually moving forward in the conversation around open source in public policy has to do with the institutionalization and maintaining knowledge, skills, and then momentum over time to actually reach scale and impact. And this study is one of uh, many reasons, but for us at OFE, the main reason why we feel comfortable to talk about uh, the potential of open source uh, in meeting strategic goals. But with that, let's uh, get to the uh, a little bit of an overview of the actual economic findings. Um, so, um, in short, the big kind of factor that we're, we're, we've been uh, focusing on and what crystallized from the study was uh, um, the importance of code contributions and increases in code contributions for, for economic growth and the posit positive externalities of this. Um, something I think most of, of you in the audience know is that uh, open source code and components are integrated in the vast majority of software. Um, and a lot of reasons for this. I mean, it's everywhere today. Um, we might know this, but it's also very good to have this empirically backed in kind of an ecosystem of documents, something that is needed to, to be repeated in, in policy discussions. Uh, in terms of economic, uh, uh, the presence in the market, open source software makes up between uh, 0.5 and 0.7 of the EU's GDP. Uh, now, uh, for a, a continent like Europe, this is a lot of money. Um, uh, to put this in perspective, it means that open source software contributes uh, uh, to the European uh, GDP in a similar way, or actually more than both air and water transport combined. So it's really a massive part of today's infrastructure. Um, in terms of a more dynamic number, um, if we saw an increase in globally available open source code uh, by 10%, we would see an increase in the EU's GDP of uh, between 0.4 and 0.6 percent. This is, as you can imagine, a big, big dynamic change in the economy. And um, in terms of uh, kind of an investment point of view, uh, uh, open source software, and this is from numbers in the private sector, uh, it has a cost benefit ratio of one to 10. Um, and if you take into account hardware and capital costs around one, one to four, um, and I really want to point out here, uh, as we at Open Forum Europe, together with Fraunhofer ISI, were the authors of the study, these are very, very conservative calculations. Uh, we, we took very much a kind of a defensive approach to really make sure we had data that we could defend uh, in any kind of circumstances. And uh, as I said before, all this taken together, it just kind of creates a new set of arguments uh, and justifies talking about open source at a way uh, higher strategic level for, for public policy. And uh, I think that in any open source policy discussions going forward, it, it will be difficult to consider any kind of uh, question without discussing these positive externalities in terms of economic growth. Um, so um, there are a lot of things that one can say about open source public policy at a strategic level. But for today's talk, um, we'll focus on what we call the institutionalization question. Um, uh, we can simplify it, building OSPOs uh, um, and uh, the role it has in, in the rollout of ambitious uh, open source policy. Claire, this is my cue to you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Aster, it's wonderful to actually get the, the, the very specifics of the economic impact because the economic growth argument is something that has been made in the past, but perhaps we haven't had been able to size that impact. But I mean, that's substantial, but you, the figures you have just quoted in terms of the potential impact for the European Union, and of course, that could be extrapolated for any other country or region across the world. So economic growth turns out to be one of the, you know, emerging policy areas that an OSPO could have an impact in. Um, just the pure idea of innovation as well, even if that's not specifically related to economic growth, we're seeing a lot of um, organizations 
um, in the public sector as well as the private sector who have an actual policy around increasing the amount of innovation that's happening. And that too can be a very specific policy that an OSPO can impact. Uh, even the concept of public money for public code is again a potential strategy or policy that an OSPO can obviously impact. Um, you mentioned, I think, before this idea of um, being able to address the idea of lock-in or being able to have a sense of control or autonomy. Um, so this, this whole idea of digital autonomy becomes a very important uh, strategy that, again, OSPOs can help to impact. SME growth is a very particular scenario within the idea of economic growth, um, but it often is a very particular goal uh, within the context of regions or countries. And it has, of course, been proven that the idea of open source and the open source ecosystems that come around the idea of technology transfer can have a very specific uh, positive benefit on SME growth in terms of that innovation ecosystem. But of course, even beyond the idea of economic impact, the idea of uh, social policies that that governments or cities might want to roll out, they too can have an impact uh, from open source and in particular OSPOs uh, in the idea of actually uh, creating competitive markets. And, and most importantly, in my, my idea would be the idea of transparency and trust. So as a general goal for uh, public sector organizations, the, importancy, the importance of actually increasing transparency and trust in public services has really come to the fore, in particular in recent times through the pandemic and, and in, in for other reasons as well, of course. Um, but that is an area in which open source and OSPOs in particular can have that huge impact. And if you can go on to the next slide there, Aster, thank you very much. Those policy goals can then often directly translate into public sector OSPO goals. And what we have here is a wide range of potential goals for a public sector OSPO. Um, and you'll see many of them have correlations and, and are similar to the goals that a private sector OSPO may have, like being a center of excellence for perhaps, perhaps governance and compliance and, and legal issues. Um, the idea of just being an area that we would promote the sharing and reuse of code, community building around open source projects, cultural change and change behaviors. We, we mentioned these before in the context of, or these are very well known own goals in the, in, the, in the context of corporate OSPOs. Um, but there may be additional areas in the, in the area of public sector OSPOs where these goals may extend. Now, it, it's probably worth noting, Astor, and you know this as well as I do, that for the most part, every single public sector organization we talk to have a different set of goals, right? Like it's, it's, it's not like there's one size fits all in the public sector OSPO space, um, but they often can be chosen from, from this list of goals. The idea of technology transfer um, and innovation in the context of that is an, is an important one. Digital skills beyond the idea of training up your employees, but actually as a broader digital skills agenda within a country or region um, can often be linked to OSPO goals. As we mentioned before, specific goals around social and economic development, digital autonomy, diversity and inclusion, and pathways into tech that may be, that may be giving additional ways for people to actually get into technology. And um, that's an important potential goal. Um, and cross-border initiatives, where we may have to actually introduce shared languages or, or be able to address minorities in, in the case of a region. Um, and then this idea again of transparency and the link to open data, because we're seeing more and more OSPOs um, sometimes actually straddle the idea of open source software and open data in order to make that open data more usable and, and reusable, I guess, in, in, in that respect. Um, so there's some of the areas that we're starting to see public sector OSPOs, where they may have goals. And, and now maybe I'll put, put uh, hand it back over to you, Aster, to, to talk more about the very specific OSPO recommendations that were contained in the European Commission report. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, the point of view and the reason why these, these OSPO recommendations were, were put in place is uh, in order to kind of introduce policies to make open source uh, scale for real in Europe, in order to benefit citizens, um, there's a broad concept, but to really be able to address uh, strategic challenges and big policy goals, um, uh, we see the need for, for uh, an institutional infrastructure. And this has to do with providing competence and direction and becoming kind of that glue that makes uh, public policies made in, let's say, a government or, or in a ministry uh, have effects on the ground. Um, it's not enough to just like throw money out into uh, the open source ecosystem because it's not that simple of a question. Let's say if you want to make public investments, 
where do you invest? Uh, we need all these infrastructures um, and this interface between the policymakers and the open source ecosystem. And um, the starting point, and very much uh, here, the focus is on the European Commission. And from that angle, uh, we, we, we will look at this, but this would be relevant for, for any national government as well. Um, so our first step is that we recommend actively using the European Commission, OSPO, um, as the Commission's external collaboration interface to, to uh, other OSPO-enabled uh, institutions within industry, research institutions, uh, universities, and across borders. Uh, this, of course, to give them credit, this is already in the works in the Commission, but we really wanted to reinforce this work, that this is the center and the interface with which the Commission connects to all these diverse stakeholders in the open source ecosystem. Um, then um, very typical classic policy recommendation, but it's an important step uh, step to take, is for, for the European Commission to, to identify and map the existing uh, European OSPOs in, in industry, uh, public sector and academia, with the aim to exchange you know, information, share best practices. Uh, and all this is meant to feed into the process of identifying, let's say, gaps in some spaces, identifying strategies around uh, recommendation three, which is the kind of first investment recommendation that we put forward. And that is uh, it, essentially for the commission to encourage uh, the building of 10 government OSPOs uh, through its funding programs. Um, consider this kind of as a pilot program. Um, as, as we all know, uh, in industry, there is already a steady increase in the number of OSPOs this can and should be encouraged as well. This is part of the conversation. But for the public sector, um, we ask them to leverage funding programs such as uh, Horizon Europe and Digital Europe um, um, to speed up this process and to already from uh, uh, the outset, and here it will bring us to the last point, um, adding on certain requirements so kind of not standardizing as such but adding certain key features that would be part of uh, uh, of building these government ospos and one of those uh, um, requirements in our view should be giving not just the commission's ospo a networking uh, a component but also these 10 that they're building um, and the idea here we'll get into this a little bit later it's about leapfrogging the maturity uh, of OSPOs that we've seen in the private sector uh, in order to really facilitate the building of an OSPO network. We think that it's at the network level we will be able to create this infrastructure to really realize the, the big ambitious goals. And this uh, yeah, brings us to, to the final points, which we'll discuss also just kind of in a broader uh, perspective as well, uh, Claire and I, but uh, we recommend the European Commission to create a program meant to network these, these OSPOs. So it uh, uh, includes the European Commission's own OSPO. The OSPOs identified uh, in the kind of landscaping exercise of, uh, of industry, public sector, and academia, as well as the OSPOs uh, uh, formed with support from the EU funding programs. Um, within this like specific subgroup for different sectors can be considered. Uh, but I do think that it's in order, as we all know from collaboration, there needs to be a backbone, uh, well-funded, well-informed, well-connected that uh, uh, can bring this all together in a more kind of cohesive infrastructure for open source in the public sector and how it links to the wider ecosystem. And um, then perhaps let's take this to, to the next level and start discussing how we see this kind of work on a more global visionary level and the potential, the political potential that all of actually have. Uh, Claire? Yeah, thanks, Aster. And I think, um, you know, the points you made about the, the ability for the public sector OSPOs to learn from the private sector OSPOs is a great one. I mean, <clears throat> if you even think about the gathering here today, of the to-do group and, and all the OSPOs uh, representatives that are here in the audience today. We have so much in the public sector, we have so much to learn from the great work that has already gone on in the public sector, in the private sector, should I say. Um, so there has been, there's a great wealth of knowledge there, uh, much of which can actually be applied directly in the context of public sectors, but some of which may need to be tweaked. And we, we've learned that in our discussions that uh, you, it's not necessarily just a lift and shift uh, into some of these new public sector contexts, uh, but that discussion and that starting point is, is, is it's really, really valuable to have that. So I think 
when we think about having this network, one of the main goals needs to be um, a learning goal, uh, not just in terms of learning from the private sector, but also in terms of having all these new government OSPOs and public sector OSPOs learn from each other, because it's such a fast evolving space and people are only beginning to realise the potential and the opportunities around this. So sharing practices and challenges um, is really part of, of, of a goal for this OSPO network. And I think one point here uh, to add, uh, this strengthening the links between diverse organizations, I think this is one of the most uh, interesting things uh, from a public policy point of view. I mean, open source at heart, why it's exploded um, is that many organizations, be it companies or, or foundations, realize that um, a lot of the, the challenges that we're asked to solve today, one company, one city, one country, doesn't have the resources themselves to solve them. The challenges are greater than that. Uh, then in order for us to collaborate, uh, we need to lower the kind of transaction costs between very diverse sets of institutions. In this space, the open source license is an incredibly interesting kind of institution or norm through which we can enable this collaboration without uh, MOUs, without massive contracts. The kind of norms and the infrastructure to collaborate is already in place and well tested and successful. And I think um, um, it connects to all these other challenges, especially from a European context of getting countries to collaborate, but cities to collaborate. Uh, we have this very interesting open source license as a norm to collaborate on that we can we have only begun to start thinking what kind of challenges we could tackle using this uh, uh, this approach it's, it's a great point because every time that's mentioned I think about the example um, that Saeed Shadri uses uh, he's, he, he runs the open source program office in Johns Hopkins University and he talks about that collaboration that happened with uh, the city of Paris and their Lutece platform and how they, he, he took Lutece and he was implementing it for a local neighbourhood centre um, in Baltimore um, the St Francis Neighbourhood Centre and he talks about the fact that you know if, if he had actually had the task of actually setting up an MOU between a local neighborhood center, Johns Hopkins University, and a city in Europe. Um, I mean, they'd still be talking about it today in terms of actually wrangling through how that would work legally in terms of shared code and things like that. Uh, but the fact that everyone could do it under open source licenses meant that they spent all that time and all that effort actually building value um, and creating value for all concerned. And I think it's a, it's a great example. But, but removing that friction from collaboration between these different scales of organizations and, and where they may be placed geographically, that's a huge, huge value point um, that, that can't be underestimated, really. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning, just in the context of these diverse organizations, like one thing we've noted as well is that there's often organ like there's groupings and organizations and individuals in many public sector bodies who might be doing a lot of what we've just described as OSPO goals. I mean, they may, it may already be happening. They may just not call themselves an OSPO, um, but there is value in having a recognizable name so that when someone from Johns Hopkins is talking to someone from the city of Paris, they know who to connect to. They know who to contact when they're looking for collaboration opportunities. Um, and so I think that idea of, even if you have very diverse organizations with completely, you know, geographically diverse, maybe diverse in scale or diverse in, in their end goal, they still have this interface point, this familiar contact point, um, if you have an institutional construct like an OSPO. So I, th I think that's an important one to mm. call out, this idea that, number one, you may already have people doing it, but the name, having a name that's familiar to people can be a huge benefit in that mapping exercise and that discoverability. Yeah. You talked about earlier. Which, in fact, is we have added that as one of the recommendations in the European Commission study as well, to actually call it an OSPO. Uh, it might sound like a small point, mm. but uh, in terms of uh, institutional uh, interoperability, semantic interoperability is important. Calling it the same thing um, really matters. And I think, think uh, it's one one of the many examples of how we can lower the transaction costs between these organizations. And here, I think, also an important thing here, it's, as we move and start talking about this, the, the, you know, we're, we've started talking about this global network of OSPOs. Let's not forget, you know, there are many different levels where the OSPO needs to be relevant. It's, uh, we're not just, you know, um, uh, in a pipe dream here talking about like, oh, networking all these things. Of course, at the end of the day, the OSPO set up in an organization needs to serve that organization's needs. It needs to solve the open source challenges and, um, uh, you know, meet 
uh, work to meet the goals set out in the organization's open source strategy. That is all good. But what we really want to push and encourage here is also not losing track of um, that networking component. If you look at the private sector, a large a sign of maturity around a private sector OSPO is them networking formally or informally with other OSPOs in uh, in the similar industry or on the user side, etc. That kind of networking part, it took a few years, I would say a decade or so for it to develop. I think this is a great opportunity for the public sector and the academic sector to kind of leapfrog that development and kind of start off having the, the um, networking and collaborative uh, component built in from the start. Yeah, I mean, that, and that definitely allows for this idea of increased citizen value. I mean, that's what this is all about. The idea being that for no matter where you are in the world, and to the point you made earlier, um, there's no one city or region that can solve today's problems by themselves. I mean, I mean, just even thinking about the amount of open source, uh, you know, projects that people are leveraging today, when we think about the very specific needs of cities and regions and countries, um, there, there are often common threads. Um, but there are often very specific contextual things that need to change. It's a perfect environment for, for using open source. So getting, you know, accelerating that citizen value is what we're talking about here. And having OSPOs as a tool to do that um, in the context of local policies is, is exactly uh, the, the opportunity that we see here. The trust is also very important because, you know, as we're moving to a stage now where perhaps there's a decline in trust in public organizations, we need to find ways to bring that trust back in and indeed, the idea that you can point to examples of the code being used in different parts of the world can really increase that trust and increase people's willingness to jump on these projects and to actually invest in them, which again is an, is an incredibly important point. Um, but I think as well that the idea of actually having everyone engaged, like giving citizens an ability to be able to see what's happening, not just in terms of being able to trust what's happening, but also being able to actually have an impact on their own lives, like that's hugely valuable too, right? Like it's it's uh, the idea of 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 that agency and being able to be a part of what's happening in technology in your city or country. That's that's great because it means that it's just not someone building something for you, it's building things with you. Um, and, and I think that's, that's again, another very, very important benefit uh, that we can see from this global network because it's people coming together from all around the world to build things together. There's a huge um, community building uh, potential in that. And while this sounds like big words, you're all here in the audience, you're part of the, the open source ecosystem. It works, it is happening, it is actually done. It's one of the great examples um, probably in history where this kind of collaboration has taken place. Let's just start expanding on the kind of challenges and issues that we could help solve in this kind of mode of collaboration and innovation. I think that's very important. I think here it's a point of encouragement as well, right, Claire? Of get out there and support and help kind of expand your view of how you could spend your time in in uh, in terms of contributions to open source or uh, how to teaching how to engage with open source in the ecosystem and and just even when we think about corporate ospo goals um obviously you will have your own goals in the context of the communities you're already involved in but perhaps they can be extended to um include some of the corporate social responsibility goals your organization has and giving your um employees even maybe beyond the software development employees an opportunity to actually uh, work on some of these global projects that we know are coming out from places like the who or united nations um and certainly uh, it would be wonderful to start seeing uh, this network of this global network of OSPOs include not just the public sector OSPOs, but also all the private sector OSPOs and how they can actually interface and help this journey uh, for citizen value. I think that would be an excellent outcome. Yeah, couldn't agree more. From, from the hyper-local to the global, there's, uh, there, there's a role for open source stakeholders to play almost everywhere as we're moving into digital public services or the interaction with um, the public sector and citizens and companies will be more and more digitized. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, but you know we're in a good place and we have a great model to uh, start looking for tools to solve, uh, solve some of the most interesting and chal uh, challenging issues that, that we have facing us.
Completely agreed, Aster. And so I suppose with that, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up this talk. I know you're there in person to take questions. I'm sorry I can't be there in person as well. I hope you've all are having and will continue to have a fantastic conference. Um, but thank you all very, very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thank you. So yeah, do let me know if you have any questions. I was weird to listen to myself for like 25 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, any questions or thoughts or statements? Please. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Um, I think there are probably many different ways it could be done. So working with open source in, um, and public policy, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of it is and will touch on procurement law. Like you probably, if you've engaged in the space at all, uh, there are arguments around public money, public code, public procurement in terms of software should only go to, uh, um, they should only procure open source uh, solutions and services. This is all good and fine as an idea. Um, there are, however, quite a lot of examples. I think Italy might be the best one. They have a, an almost perfect law that states exactly this and nothing's happening. They've had it for several years. Um, and I think this is an interesting thing to reflect over. I mean, this has to do with enforcement, of course. Are there like penalties with not following it? So there's a lot of details everywhere in how you design these things. But also just kind of helping the individual um, public servant who needs to uh, abide by this law with clear guidelines, how to work. And here is kind of, again, the point where we really start looking at the institutionalization, building up OSPOs. Um, because it will be that center of excellent, excellence and knowledge that would help people across um, very different diverse organizations actually follow these things, develop guidelines on how to procure open source. Um, it is a different mode of thinking. It's a different mode of procurement. So I think we just have to keep on thinking long and hard, but it's not just about writing that great law and that regulation. It has to do with you know classic things like, you know, changing culture internally. And a very important thing, and uh, we had a conversation with the European Commission and you and uh, OSPO guys on this. They, they were asked, like, what would you ask, like, what would you like to have in order to actually progress with this? And they said, time. Give us time. We need to learn. We need to figure a lot of things out. Uh, there's so many examples of you know, uh, kind of politically driven pushes into open source from cities and regions. But then that party might be voted out of government and then it stops. And that's where institutionalization is important. You need to have something that lasts over time. And even for big companies that are often fast, faster moving than the public sector, it took time for them to figure out open source and how to do it. And institutionalization was a big part of it. Um, so I think we, there is no, which I think many wish there was, like a quick solution, write this law and then we're fine. No, we have to work from the ground up, really get buy-in, et cetera. Well, things are moving at least. Denise? Yeah, one of the things that I think I'm seeing is a, a more fertile ground in innovation and innovative ways of doing Um, let's see if I now I started thinking about a bunch of different things. So let, stop me if I'm answering the wrong question here. Uh, 
I, I made this point uh, in the talk about, I made perhaps a not super exact differentiation between old and new arguments for open source in the public sector or in public policy. Um, the the quote-unquote old arguments are still valid. There are still good arguments around cost savings, um, let's say that you can share and reuse between sectors and, and regions and cities using each other's software solutions, etc. All this is still relevant. Um, what we're interested in, and this is perhaps shaped by the fact that we work mostly with the EU institutions where the kind of systems level goals is what really matters, like across Europe. Um, we're interested in trying to move new stakeholders and new participants and perhaps politicians of a different color to start being interested in these questions to move it at a bigger scale because the arguments about cost saving and let's say cities or regions that cannot afford the proprietary solutions they might be already by those circumstances forced into quote unquote forced into having to deal with open source What's interesting is to start looking and discussing why should, let's say, a country have a targeted open source policy? Maybe it's because of the economic growth. The fact that investing, like in procurement law, instead of saying you have to buy open source, it's rather how do you justify buying a proprietary solution uh, over an open source solution when there are proven economic externalities and positive benefits to the economy by releasing more code? More, there are like direct links, direct causation between um, more open source in the economy and startups being founded. Like there's more access and there are more ways of doing business around this, right? Um, so I think instead of completely shifting the attitude and what arguments we're using, let's just be flexible and realize that there are so many more arguments that are there to be used today. Um, there's also, of course, just the the digital autonomy argument, which is, I like talking about it in the context of open technologies. I mean, part of it because our think tank deals with that, so it's, <laughs> it's nice. But uh, instead of talking about digital autonomy and just you know, building um, walls around your country only by our country's technology and throw a bunch of money on perhaps solutions that are not that good, focus on, op like, focus on open, maintain control, have access. Uh, lower the cost of switching providers and vendors. That also gives a public institution the sense of control that I think the discussions about digital autonomy actually, that is what they're actually about at the end of the day. So I feel like I, I kind of went on the side of your question, yeah, but I hope that was all right. Yeah. Okay, um, we're gonna uh, go to the last speaker, so I guess uh, we are a bit sure. out of time.